everyone, and welcome to Destination New England. I'm Sarah Cody. Now, we've all been through an unprecedented time during the pandemic, sheltering in place, juggling distance learning and working from home, checking on friends and family. Now, New England worked really hard and is in the midst of a phased reopening, including museums like the beautiful Connecticut River Museum here in Essex, along with hotels and restaurants. And certainly there's pent up demand. Research shows that folks want to get out, but safety is a top priority and concern. During the next hour, we'll take a look at how Connecticut, Rhode Island, Western Massachusetts and Vermont are opening back up with new protocols in place. We begin Destination New England with a new way to see the Connecticut coast, one that's fresh, fast and focused on social distancing. <laughs> You think you know Mystic, but you may not be familiar with this <laughs> okay. Mystic Boat Adventures. What we offer is a pretty unique experience. I'm the only one within 900 miles of doing this. These unique foam-filled two-person pontoon boats are perfect for social distancing with family or close friends. When I have a group here, we require everybody wears a mask. Okay, while we're on the boat doing the orientation. Boat kill switch for the motor. Once I push you off the dock, you can take your mask off and enjoy the ride, enjoy the experience. Owner Rob Roach usually leads the pack in his own boat. Today I'm jumping on with you. But today, he's my passenger. <laughs> That's all right, we're good. What we're gonna do this morning, Sarah, we're gonna have a nice little raft of river. Right off. There's one spot in the river where you're allowed to open the boat up a little bit. Guests experience what these small, agile boats can do. I'd put the throttle right down. I'd put it right down. Let's just say donuts. And figure eights. Take your steering and bring it up forward. Aren't usually the norm on boat tours. Woo! But the show does go on. the Mystic River Bascule Bridge. As we head into historic territory, there's a family affair. To see Mystic Seaport in a whole new way. A famous ship, the Mayflower II, been on a three year major restoration project, is visiting from Massachusetts. It's really neat. Oh, it's amazing. Get up close and personal with the steamship Sabino. Okay, we'll continue on. The Mystic Whaler and more. This is the pride and joy of the Mystic Seaport. It's the Charles W. Morgan, 1841, stolen commission. Then the journey takes a turn. We're out at uh, Ram Island, it's a privately owned island. Into wilder territory. Towards the end of the tour, we're in for a real treat that's actually in the state of New York. And here in the open ocean, we can really get some speed. In the foggy mist, you can see the lighthouse five miles away. We race towards an incredibly dramatic sight. Latimer Reef Light, standing tall and regal in waters where New York, Rhode Island, and Connecticut meet. This is incredible out here. The perfect way to wrap up three exciting hours. Part sightseeing, part thrill ride. <laughs> it's an experience you won't soon forget. They'll be talking about this at Christmas time or Thanksgiving at the dinner table laughing. There's nothing like it. And while you're in Mystic, consider visiting the aquarium. There's something for all ages. Outdoor and indoor exhibits are open with guidelines in place. You must buy tickets online, wear a face mask, get your temperature checked upon arrival, and follow the one ways throughout the campus. But these could change, so be sure to check mysticaquarium.org for updates. Moving over to an iconic area in Massachusetts, Cape Cod. The beaches are open, but rules are in place, like wearing a mask when you're walking from the parking lot to the beach. We continue our tour of the shore. Now, a day at the beach is a way of life for Rhode Islanders, and it's not called the ocean state for nothing. Large bays and inlets make up 14% of the area. Will Gilbert shows us why there's so much to love. Rhode Island may be the smallest state, but our beaches pack a big punch. Rhode Island, more than 400 miles of coastline because of the bay and because of rivers like this. So of those 400 miles, probably three or four miles um, are state beaches. Rhode Island has eight state beaches that welcome locals and tourists from across the country and around the world. The reason is that they're so accessible. 
white sandy beaches. We welcome folks from everywhere. Westerly Rhode Island has one of the most popular beaches to stick your feet in the sand. Musquamica Beach, which is our biggest beach and is our most popular beach. It attracts more than 350,000 beachgoers every year, 80% of whom are from Connecticut. You know, other state beaches like Scarborough Beach, and we have the Scarborough North and South in Narragansett. 50% of the beachgoers who visit Scarborough are from out of state. For many, the beaches in Rhode Island are a place to relax and escape. That is really underscored during the COVID pandemic. Wherever you are in the country, we've all been struggling with being cooped up inside and, and what it does to our minds. You know, we got to get outside. We got to recreate. All eight state run beaches bring in about 1 million visitors every year. Those visitors are spending $100 million on gas, meals, lodging, souvenirs, you know, bars, restaurants, all that kind of spending when they're visiting the beaches. So they're really economic powerhouses too and we're we're very mindful of that with respect to businesses we know that those beaches are the lifeblood of so many like hundreds of businesses rhode island beaches have always been a place to relax and create lasting memories with family including me when folks come to visit beaches or parks we know that they're creating special memories at these places you know like they mark the passage of time Every year they go back to a spot. They mark their own children's growth. Every year they go back to a spot. You know, life goes on. Rhode Island beaches are ready to welcome you with open arms and some SPF 30. We have boogie board rentals, chair rentals, umbrella rentals. I mean, if you don't have stuff and you're from out of state, just rent it at the beach that day. So we have all kinds of great attractions that we think make Rhode Island beaches measure up to be as good as any that you find anywhere. So come join me at the beach. I'll save a spot for you. For Destination New England, I'm Will Gilbert. The Burlington waterfront has been coined Vermont's gem, partially because of its extraordinary sights and many attractions. And in this unique area, those activities are back on track with cleanliness and masks in mind. Courtney Kramer takes us there. On any given summer day, the Burlington waterfront is the place to be for Vermonters and visitors alike. It is one of the most beautiful places, I would say, in the United States. And the natural beauty of Lake Champlain is just the beginning of the waterfront's draw. You'll almost always find people picnicking and relaxing on the park's green spaces and others enjoying the eight-mile bike path that runs through the park. There are also so many options for getting out on the water, whether it's by kayak, paddle boat, or even a dinner cruise on the spirit of Ethan Allen. Or you can get your own scenic scenic boat ride, charter, charter a boat, and enjoy the waterfront that way. So land or water, there's many ways to enjoy the, um, the waterfront. Years ago, the waterfront area was booming with industrial activity, and petroleum was even stored under the park. In the 80s, the city of Burlington acquired it, which led to its cleanup and redevelopment. A lot of the credit for the Burlington waterfront being what it is today, you know, a lot of that goes back to Bernie Sanders and that sense of that the waterfront being a, the people's place. The waterfront is also home to some of the Queen City's biggest celebrations and festivals, including the annual 3rd of July fireworks spectacular, the Jazz Festival, Oktoberfest, and more. With so much action, you're sure to get hungry. Luckily, there are a few restaurants sprinkled right along the lake. To have a meal sitting right out on the water looking out to the Adirondacks is incredibly special. But do leave room for dessert because everyone needs to try a creamy when they visit Vermont. In Burlington, I'm Courtney Kramer reporting. As New England slowly recovers from the pandemic, restrictions are always changing. Be sure to visit the state's websites. There's a list of them on our screen now. Before you take a trip, stay informed and stay safe. Still to come, an exploration and discovery park where hard work pays off. And history comes to life. What's new at Old Sturbridge Village? is the brownstone quarry. In the late 1800s, material mined from here was used in the construction of college campuses and apartment buildings in cities like New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Boston, and New Haven. It's a national historic landmark, and now it's also the site of some pretty awesome modern fun. 
talking rock walls, giant blobs, and an epic zip line that takes thrill seekers off the edge of a cliff to soar through the sky before a dramatic finale, skimming the water's surface. It was really high and like the adrenaline rush, it was fun. I feel like I was nervous, but like for no reason, because it was like fun afterwards, but it was scary. Come on and experience Brownstone Exploration and Discovery Park, where entertainment is active. You're climbing, you're jumping, you're swimming everywhere you go. Almost every attraction is open. Can you come out of the water just for a second so I can tighten your life jacket? It's a pretty usual scene, even during an unusual time. We are at 25% capacity, so it's a limited capacity. We're requiring everyone to buy their tickets in advance. That way we can keep our numbers right. Visitors wear masks on the docks, not in the water. We have hand sanitizing stations everywhere and cleaning buckets everywhere. So equipment is cleaned after every use. It's enough to make anyone feeling a little stir crazy. I'm scared too. <laughs> loosen up and become a kid again. Oh. Take a daring plunge. <laughs> then navigate to a new activity. Slip or slide. Lean back, cross your arms. With speed and style. Oh, it was a blast. It was so much fun. It was nice to be out and about safely. Okay. Trust us, plan ahead, and the current conditions will make your trip here even more enjoyable. The one comment I continue to hear is, this place is empty. It's never this empty. And it's true. At 25% capacity, the park looks empty. You have a chance to do every activity and, and really not wait in huge lines. A unique destination that inspires exhilaration and exhaustion. You want the kids to go home tired. Everyone gets a good night's sleep, even the employees after a day at Brownstone. Tourism is slowly returning in Connecticut as more places and amenities start to reopen. The director of the state's tourism office has more information. Our industry is, is very resilient. And our industry is going to become, will come back. We're happy with, with what's, um, you know, what's coming about. The, the attractions, the restaurants, the hotels are, are doing a superb job. I'm really uh, couldn't be more happy. New England is sure full of rich history. And there's one Massachusetts destination that really takes visitors back in time. Now with a focus on outdoor exhibits due to health precautions. Let's join Alana Flood at Old Sturbridge Village. Take a step back in time and visit Old Sturbridge Village, a recreation of an 1838 community that's not only fun, but educational. Old Sturbridge Village, the largest outdoor history museum in the Northeast, is a living museum and learning resource of New England life. With lots of interactive experiences for children and history buffs alike, your visit there will be a memorable one. Old Sturbridge Village is a recreated early 19th century village showing basically everyday life and what it would have been like in an agricultural village out in the New England countryside. We try to make it as immersive as possible. I and mean, when you walk around the museum, you'll see you know, interpreters wearing authentic 1830s clothing. Um, you'll see appropriate heritage breed animals uh, throughout the museum. Um, you'll see you know, all sorts of, of trades being recreated, all sorts of historic households with cooking going on and other demonstrations. Um, so you can expect to see a little bit of a snippet of what you would experience in your everyday life in the 1830s. I think when, when people visit the museum, they'll be surprised at how lively the museum looks because so many people are now working outside of their exhibits. So previously when you come to the museum, although we might have had a million things going on, um, a lot of people were in the building, so you couldn't necessarily see them. Now when you walk onto the common of the museum, you can see people doing all sorts of different chores and work um, and just kind of going about their day. Old Sturbridge Village has gotten creative during the pandemic and thought of ways to continue to make the experience impactful. 
all the trade shops are open to the public. So you can see the blacksmith and the potter. Um, they're still working inside of their space, but you'll be able to view from the outside. And in cases where, for instance, our tin shop and to some extent our pottery shop, where it's you don't get the best visibility to view the demonstrations, we've actually taken things outside. So our tin shop is now happening outside. So all of the tinning is all out there under a tent so people can see much better what's going on. We're doing kids free for July, um, but we have all sorts of activities for little kids. Of course, they love the animals. They love going around on the carryall drawn by the horses. Um, but then we also have a lot of, you know, a serious historical discussion as well for adults who want to engage in that type of opportunity. But there's also other opportunities just wandering the grounds. I mean, a lot of our visitors coming back now that we've reopened have purely been coming because they just want to wander our beautiful grounds that we've been taking care of throughout the shutdown. Everyone has their own thing they're here for as well, right? So a lot of people come to see how people cooked in the time period or, you know, what types of clothing people wore, that sort of thing. So, um, so people come for all different reasons, but I would say animals and, and the grounds are probably the most common thing people come for in the history, of course. That's what we're all about. And speaking of clothing, so I'm just wearing some some typical summer clothing for a, a tradesman in the time period. Um, so very commonly you'd say, although it looks very fancy to us nowadays, the standards of dress are very, very different in the 19th century. And even though it's July and it's very hot, you're still expected as a man to be wearing, you know, your hat and your jacket and all that sort of thing. So you would change the type of clothing you were wearing, much like we do nowadays, to the season. So the difference is, you know, in the, in the wintertime, I'm wearing a very heavy coat and maybe like a wool cap or something like that. In the summertime, I've got a nice lightweight linen jacket, uh, but everything is cut the same. It all looks the same. It just, you know, as a man walking out in society, going out without a jacket on the summertime was not really all too proper. So you'd still try to wear all those layers to look, to look, you know, like you had pride in your appearance. And you'll see the same thing with ladies costume as well. Besides having a great time, there are a few things to keep in mind when you visit. So the main thing you need to know is, first off, you need to bring a mask with you because everyone's required to wear them. Um, but you also need to reserve your ticket. So at this point, we're only allowing about 1,000 people in a day. So you need to reserve for one of three time slots throughout the day. Um, and that way you can guarantee that when you come in, we're not going to be overwhelmed with visitors. You'll get through much quicker and just guarantee you have a better experience. Mm -hmm. Well, we have an awful lot to offer. You know, everything from, again, beautiful grounds to walk around, um, good conversation with people. You can learn a lot. You can be outside, take in the animals. Um, we've got good food. So, so there's an awful lot to take in right here in Central Mass. In Sturbridge, Massachusetts, I'm Alana Flood. Tourism is also alive in Massachusetts. Trails have been seeing more visitors, and Deerfield River is doing well with zip lines and whitewater rafting. We spoke with the president of the Greater Springfield Convention and Visitors Bureau about that. There is pent up demand. You know, the longer we stayed in with the quarantine and the stay at home, I think, and the weather turned, people do want to get out. And that's where I'm really grateful that I represent a destination that has a lot of green space. And so we're ideal for social distancing. Still to come on Destination New England, we are packing up a picnic and taking you to some of the most scenic parks in the Northeast. taking a staycation this summer, maybe you're looking for a low-key adventure. Try a picnic in the park. First up, let's take you to Hubbard Park in Meriden, Connecticut, located just outside the center of the city. This local favorite is lined with flower gardens and wildlife. Pull up your picnic blanket alongside Mirror Lake, and then consider hiking one of the many trails, leading to the main attraction, Castle Craig. The tower was given to the people of Meriden back in 1900 by Walter Hubbard, a generous philanthropic citizen. The spectacular view is 1,000 2 feet above sea level. Next, we're heading to Hidden Valley Nature Preserve, located in picturesque Washington, Connecticut. This hidden gem offers 17 miles of trails along the Chapaug River. Be sure to cross the Thoreau Bridge, lined with quotes from the transcendentalist writer. There's some hidden history here, too. It was once home to a quartz mine, until it was abandoned in 1915. But you can still walk among the small quartz pebbles left behind after your scenic hike. Head to one of the small meadows for your picnic. 
Our last Connecticut stop takes us to Stratton Brook State Park, located in Simsbury. This quaint reserve is surrounded by forest. You can stroll along its laid-back trails made for any experience level. There are plenty of places for a picnic, including a spacious beachfront. But keep in mind this is an inland state park, so swimming is not allowed right now amid the pandemic. Next up, historic Bristol, Rhode Island. Colt State Park has over 400 acres of lawns, stone walls, and paved bicycle paths. And let's not forget the incredible water views. Soak in breathtaking panoramic sights of Narragansett Bay and the fishing pier. Now over to Milton, Vermont. Sandbar State Park is nestled between the Champlain Islands and a wildlife refuge. It's a perfect spot for a relaxing day in the sun. Or maybe you want to be more in tune with nature. Consider a camping trip. The park is allowing tents and RVs right now, but again, restrictions are always changing, so check the Vermont government website for updates. Out-of-state visitors must fill out a form that certifies they have met COVID-19 safety requirements. Now let's take you to Westfield, Massachusetts. Stanley Park is a sanctuary for wildlife with duck ponds and native foliage. It's even home to authentic dinosaur tracks. Break out the yoga mat too. Summer yoga in the park is underway. These relaxing classes are for everyone. You can stretch out and unwind right behind the rose garden. But keep in mind only 30 people a class to maintain social distancing. As New England slowly recovers from the pandemic, restrictions are always changing. Be sure to visit the state's websites. There's a list of them on our screen now. Before you take a trip, stay informed and stay safe. Still ahead, there's room for our four-legged friends on our New England adventure. One mountain in Vermont is going to the dogs, serving as a sanctuary. Attention all pet lovers, this is a story for you. Now our pups have enjoyed having their owners home a little bit more, but maybe they're itching to get out too. Jolie Sherman takes us to a Vermont spot that's perfect for man and man's best friend. <coughs> At Dog Mountain, you'll hear that sound all around. Set on a private mountain spot in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, dogs are free to run, play, swim, and meet other dogs. Oh, another one! I don't Hi, everybody. After losing his own dog in the 90s, creator and artist Stephen Hunick wanted to create a special place for dogs and their owners. And one of Stephen's biggest mottos, I love to say, is dream without limits. Because when you think about when we start dreaming, reality starts putting limits on and, oh, can't do that. Oh, it's too expensive. Oh, what if nobody comes? And thankfully, he followed that rule. Dog Mountain is home to the one and only Dog Chapel, what Hunick would describe as his largest and most personal artwork. Stephen really wanted to create a place for someone to mourn, to love, to laugh, to watch all these dogs running around, having fun, playing. It's like, wow, <laughs> you know? Dog Mountain's creative director, Amanda McDermott, worked for Stephen and his wife, Gwen, for over 15 years. Stephen Hunick died in 2009 and his wife three years later. It was really hard when we lost him because, you know, he was the captain of the ship, we kind of felt. Today, his memory lives on through his art inside the Stephen Eunuch Gallery, which houses over 700 of his paintings. One dog owner enjoys visiting the park and even came back this year to celebrate her dog's birthday. He made a lot of doggy friends last summer, which is, which is really nice. Um, the grounds for hiking are beautiful. Um, and, you know, you come back in the fall and the foliage can't be beat. McDermott says the park reminds visitors of an important message. Just one person did this. Just one person. Don't let anyone tell you that one person can't make a difference because you are standing on the living proof that one person can make a difference. And thank goodness he did. I spoke with a few visitors today as well as a few furry ones who come here often. The park plans to stay open during this time and is committed to keeping Stephen Hunick's vision alive. From one furry friend to another, a new form of hiking is a growing family activity in Connecticut. Newtown's Rowanwood Farm is the only licensed llama hiking company in the state. 
The exotic animal is a calming companion throughout your adventure. Keep in mind, this video was taken before the pandemic. Organizers now have safety measures in place, allowing small groups to hike. More hiking is ahead on Destination New England. Break out the map, we're headed for the Berkshire Mountains. A tour of the trails. Welcome back to Destination New England. Now a good hike is a great way to relax and connect with nature and Western Massachusetts has a lot of great trails that will appeal to anyone of any ability. And certainly it's great terrain for social distancing. Patrick Berry shows us around. When most people think about hiking in New England, the first thought that comes to mind is maybe the Green Mountains of Vermont or the White Mountains of New Hampshire. But often overlooked are the Berkshire Mountains and the Holyoke Mountain Range of Western Massachusetts. Let's take a look at some of those trails now. Probably the most popular hiking trail in the United States, the Appalachian Trail, spans 90 miles through the Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts, from the Connecticut border north to Vermont. This most famous hike also traverses Massachusetts' highest peak, Mount Greylock, at nearly 3,500 feet. Aside from those 90 miles of the Appalachian Trail, there are hundreds of other miles of paths perfect for long distance hikes or just getting out for the day or a few hours. If you are an avid hiker or someone who likes to stroll in quiet places to enjoy Mother Nature, the four counties of Western Massachusetts offer something for everyone. Hiking in Western Massachusetts can be as challenging or as easy as you want it to be. From some of the more difficult trails like the Old Berlin Mountain Ski Trail rated very difficult in the northwest corner of the Berkshires to one of the easy rated trails like the Bear Hole Reservoir in West Springfield. However you want to challenge yourself, there's a perfect trail for you. One of the perks about visiting Western Massachusetts is you're never far from a nice place to stay, a delicious meal, or a satisfying drink. There are a wealth of options for lodging, dining, and for your Apre hike watering hole to meet whatever your budget allows. Do you prefer to rough it a little with a basic campsite, or do you want some pampering and elegance from a five-star hotel? No matter your tastes or desires, you'll be able to find these and everything in between when planning your trip. Hiking in Western Massachusetts can be done year round, but be aware that the fall foliage in Massachusetts is some of the best in the country. So if you're thinking about an autumn hike, plan your trip early. If you'd like to discover more about hiking in Massachusetts, visit mass.gov or go to hikingproject.com. On a trail somewhere in Western Massachusetts, I'm Patrick Berry. As New England slowly recovers from the pandemic, restrictions are always changing. Be sure to visit the state's websites. There's a list of them on our screen now. Before you take a trip, stay informed and stay safe. Straight ahead, alluring architecture just a walk away from the ocean. We're giving you a look inside the Newport Mansions coming up. Plus, downtown Springfield has fun and safe activities for the whole family. Whether you're a history buff or live and breathe sports, Stay with us. Welcome back to Destination New England. If you're looking for history, culture, and sophistication for your getaway, then look no further. The Berkshires in Western Massachusetts should definitely be on your list. It's home to many jaw-dropping estates. Those include the Mount, Edith Wharton's home. She was an American novelist, the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for literature. Self-guiding tours of the main house are now underway, but reservations are required. A worldwide attraction found right here in New England. Experience two centuries worth of history as you step back into the Gilded Age. Michaela Johnson takes us to the city by the sea. Rhode Island may be the smallest state, but it has some of the biggest homes and you can see for yourself when you take a tour of the Newport Mansions. There are 11 different historic sites that cover 250 years of history, starting in 1740 with the Hunter House, a beautiful colonial building, all the way through Rosecliff, which was built in 1902. I think what's really unique about the Newport Mansions, apart from the fact that it covers a, a real span of history, over 250 years, and there are a variety of different architectural styles. So again, if you're looking 
for an immersion into domestic architecture, this is the place to be. The stories of these mansions are phenomenal, and there's some really interesting characters. Cornelius Vanderbilt was the man who really got the railroad industry started in America and connected New York to Chicago, which changed the whole complexion of the nation in terms of commerce. One of the richest families ever in this country, and they built Marble House, they built the Breakers, these former summer homes attract visitors from around the globe. Our visitors come from every single state in the United States and from 100 countries. So we are an international destination. Last year, for the fourth year in a row, we gave more than one million tours. Experience the lavish lifestyle of the Gilded Age while on tour. At the Breakers, there is a family tour for children, and it is very popular because there's a lot of interaction. There are a lot of games that one can play. There is the Servant Life Tour at the Elms, which takes families up onto the roof of the Elms and into the servants' quarters, down into the basement. The houses and landscapes are equally important. If you were to remove this house, the Breakers, or any of the Newport mansions to a city block in New York City, it wouldn't be nearly as significant or as important as it is located here with this span of green lawn. It is extraordinary and what makes our houses I think really unique is the landscaping around those houses. There's the Elm Sunken Garden, there is the Serpentine Path at the Breakers, the Topiary Gardens at Green Animals. It is the largest topiary garden in North America and it's a wonderful place to take children. And the views don't end there. The mansions are just steps away from Newport's historic cliff walk and the Atlantic Ocean. If you are interested in architectural history or art or American history, within walking distance you can really get an immersion into the architecture of this nation. It's a phenomenal experience. History, architecture, and stunning views. Experience it all in Newport, Rhode Island. For Destination New England, I'm Michaela Johnson. There are some specific guidelines about visiting the mansions. Let's hear more from Rhode Island's Chief Marketing Officer. They're recommending advanced tickets online. Um, they do have a new app, so it's a self-tour. If you want an audio, you can download it ahead of time to your phone and you walk yourself through. Uh, they've put a lot of thought into the spacing inside of the, of the mansion. Springfield, Massachusetts has a wealth of arts, entertainment, and educational destinations that you should definitely put on your vacation list. Right now, there's a focus on small groups and big fun. Alana Flood and Patrick Berry take us there. Are you looking for a great New England vacation? Well, we've got two reasons why the city of Springfield should be your next stop. Tucked alongside the eastern banks of the Connecticut River in the picturesque Pioneer Valley, Springfield, Massachusetts has a rich history of innovation thanks to the many things invented here, including the first American dictionary, the first American gas-powered automobile, and even the sport of basketball. It's also home to the Springfield Museums, where just one ticket gives you full access to each of the five museums, which have a little something for everyone. We have incredible, phenomenal collections, and everyone has a favorite area of the museums that they love and always want to come back and see. But in the Fine Arts Museum, I would say one of the favorites is the French Impressionism Gallery, beautiful paintings by Monet and Degas. In the Science Museum, we have many areas that people love, for example, the Live Animal Center, the Planetarium, and of course, the Natural History Dioramas. And then over in the Wood Museum, we have an incredible collection of Indian motorcycles and automobiles, and of course, in the Smith Museum, just a splendid collection of Asian decorative arts. We are the home of the amazing world of Dr. Seuss Museum, which started out uh, in 2002 when we opened the Dr. Seuss National Memorial Sculpture Garden, which is behind us on the beautiful grounds of the Springfield Museums. But then we added on to that in 2017 when we opened the Dr. Seuss Museum, the first Dr. Seuss Museum in the world and still the only Dr. Seuss Museum in the world. And it's filled with um, really interesting exhibits that really show who he was as a person, Dr. Seuss, Ted Geisel, as well as an interactive play area that features all of his whimsical characters. 
There's another reason to visit Springfield, Massachusetts, and it's centered around one of America's favorite sports. Nearly 130 years ago, in 1891, basketball was invented by Dr. James Naismith. And today, the Basketball Hall of Fame is one of the most visited tourist attractions in downtown Springfield. Let's go inside and take a look. It doesn't matter whether you're a fan of the classic game or of today's more high-energy power game. The Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in downtown Springfield, Massachusetts has something for everyone. The Hall of Fame complex is easy to get to and sits adjacent to the Connecticut River and Route 91. There is plenty of parking, along with eating and lodging options nearby. The building is more than 40,000 square feet of basketball history, and the main rotunda of the hall is a multi-level arena. Once you enter the building, you will be overwhelmed with the sense of skill, ability, and importance that is highlighted in all of the inductees. From state-of-the-art technology to historical artifacts and pictures, visitors can travel through time to see how the game of basketball has changed over the years. Dr. James Naismith would probably never believe how popular his invention would become around the globe when as a physical education teacher, he threw a ball into a peach basket in 1891 while at the YMCA International Training School, which is now Springfield College. Today's Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame sees nearly a quarter million visitors each year to honor their sporting idols, to learn about the game, explore the interactive exhibits, and test their skills on the Jerry Colangelo Court of Dreams. Like all sports hall of fames, each year, those honored as inductees are enshrined in a star-studded red carpet event. The committees tasked with determining the inductees review all those associated with the sport. Whether they be American professionals, American or international amateurs, or difference makers, induction into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame is arguably the most comprehensive hall of fame among major American sports. Come learn about Lydia Alexeva's 1976 Soviet national team, the hijinks of the Harlem Globetrotters, and the record-setting Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and many more. For more information, visit hoopall.com. At the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in downtown Springfield, Massachusetts, I'm Patrick Berry. Another family fun destination, the Roger Williams Park Zoo in Providence, Rhode Island. The zoo is home to more than 150 rare and fascinating animals from all around the world. And their newest addition is a baby sloth. The whole family will love checking out everything from the faces of the rainforest to the impressive giraffes and snow leopard. The park is open daily. Tickets must be purchased online in advance. Still to come, submerge yourself in the creative capital. From outdoor dining to local art, we'll see more of the cultural attractions in downtown Providence. Welcome back. We're taking you from the coast to the mountains on Destination New England. Now, certainly things are going to look a little different around the Ocean State this summer, but there is still so much to do. And Providence, the creative capital, has it all. Brendan Kirby shows us around. It's no secret that Providence, Rhode Island, the creative capital, has it all. From recreational activities to fine dining and so much more, we got the scoop. There's plenty to do. We've got some great outdoor activities. Providence Kayak is back. The gondolas are back. The riverboat is back. So there's all sorts of fun stuff like that to do. And there's still events to look forward to. And you know, restaurants are open, shops are open. So there's still plenty to do. And with so much packed into the city of Providence, you can experience its rich history firsthand without even needing to drive. We have a whole bunch of historic walking tours. We have an African-American history walking tour, which is really timely right now. We've got tours of Benefit Street of downtown Providence. But I'm a walker and you can walk from downtown to Federal Hill or Thayer Street it's pretty easy. Creativity truly shines in Providence. We feel like Providence is sort of an outdoor art gallery. Wherever you go, there's murals and sculptures and even some of the trash cans and the bike racks are sculptures. So, you know, we're the creative capital. We take it seriously. So I would just have people walk around. You can find some really cool Instagram spots. Something else to look forward to? Another favorite. Providence Restaurant Week will return. We're going to do it bigger and better and a little bit later in the summer. So there'll be details coming on that. But if you loved Restaurant Weeks, this is going to add even more to it. So it's going to be a lot of fun and it'll be longer. 
From the zoo to the Children's Museum to Waterfire, one of the city's most well-known attractions, there's lots for the entire family to enjoy. Though some of these may be temporarily operating under restrictions, you can easily find out more online. So if people want to learn more about Providence, whether you're a local or you're visiting, go to our website, goprovidence.com. We've got all sorts of fun things to do this summer. So many activities, so little time. We told you they have everything. All that's missing is you. You know, because I'm already here. For Destination New England, I'm Brendan Kirby. If you're looking for something a little more luxurious, consider Ocean House in Watch Hill, Rhode Island. It's the state's only five diamond resort. Ocean House pays homage to New England's golden age of hospitality. Some of the exclusive experiences include this year's newest addition, the Taco Shack. You can hop on a blender bike to mix up your own margarita and the resort has safety protocols in place. As New England slowly recovers from the pandemic, restrictions are always changing. Be sure to visit the state's websites. There's a list of them on our screen now. Before you take a trip, stay informed and stay safe. Coming up, a new contraption on the rails makes biking even more exciting. And it's growing in popularity during the pandemic. Stay with us. Destination New England continues now, highlighting a place that's exciting for all nature lovers. Brittany Weir takes us to a spot in Vermont that's fun all year round. Located in the mountains of Jeffersonville, Vermont, is a popular family resort known for its skiing and snowboarding. You might not think of this destination in the summertime, but the scenic drive takes you to Smuggler's Notch Resort, which also has a number of swimming pools, family activities, and outdoor recreation. We've certainly scaled back on our offerings, but we've handpicked the ones that we feel uh, maintain proper social distancing and can allow people to still have a lot of fun with their family, making lasting memories while feeling like they're safe and comfortable. Smugglers has 78 trails with a total of 1,000 acres, which is the largest in Vermont. The longest running trail is three miles from the Madonna Summit to the village. Some of the popular trails include the Garden Path, Rum Runner, and Black Snake. However, with the pandemic, winter activities might look a little different. Uh, right now, our plan is to open for winter and, um, and operate accordingly within the guidelines. Even though the mountains behind me are perfect for skiing and snowboarding, Smuggler's Notch is not just a winter destination. It's also great to come here in the summer because there are a number of fun activities going on right now. One of them being the Big Smuggle, which is an event where families battle against each other and race around the resort to compete in a number of different competitions. It spans across quite a bit of our campus here at Smugs. It's outside, people are individual with their families, so staying in trusted circles, and uh, there's a lot of running around, and it's, it's pure chaos, but in an organized fashion, and people love it. For those who can make the day trip, the resort has decided to operate with an arrive, play, and leave method. This way, guests can hang out and enjoy all the resort has to offer as if they were on vacation, but then return home at the end of the day. Vacation offers, for example, access to pools, mountain bike trails. We have uh, two mountain bike skills parks. During a time when we are all learning how to operate in a new way, Smuggler's Notch still has over 40 pages of activities that the whole family can enjoy. You know, we, tr we try to offer as many outdoor activities as we can where social distancing is, is second nature. In Jeffersonville, Vermont, I'm Brittany Weir. Right down the road from the Connecticut River Museum is the Essex Steam Train and Riverboat, offering a new activity that's become really popular during the pandemic. All aboard a truly unique vehicle. When the train is away... Keep a nice pace so we can uh, all enjoy ourselves. <laughs> these new contraptions will play. When I came here 29 years ago, I never thought I'd be sitting on a rail bike on a Thursday evening uh, here on the Valley Railroad. But that's where we find Vice President of Track and Property, Rob Bradway. It's not about the speed, it's about the experience. A small fleet was acquired by the Essex Steam Train and Riverboat last fall, which turned out to be a lucky purchase certainly come in handy during the pandemic when uh, it's been the only thing we've been able to run. 
Sarah, why don't we adjust the seat for you first? The right fit is key. Just be sure you're not overextending your legs. Feels good to me. As we prepare to ride the rails. Uh, keep your hands clasped like you have them uh, so they're not hanging over the side of the bike. And then we pedal off. All right, let's do it. We set off. All aboard! From Goodspeed Station, engineering an adventure that's scenic and active. Off to the right is a beautiful Connecticut River, and we're looking at the homes on Main Street, East Haddam. The terrain is level, not too strenuous, as we roll along at about eight miles per hour, past spots both serene and busy. This is Midway Marina in Haddam, Connecticut. While the train is now running again, the bikes are still going strong. Now this is a four mile trip, but organizers will also be offering six mile and 10 mile options throughout the season. They've just fit in uh, real well. They are the perfect antidote to uh, residents in the state of Connecticut looking to get out and do something. All rail bikes are thoroughly cleaned in between trips. Hello class and welcome to Rail Bike University. During group outings, bikes are properly spaced apart. Once. Family members, kids to seniors, can abandon masks when they ride together. This is great. Uh, you know, my granddaughter is doing most of the pedaling, so I'm just kind of coasting around for the ride. Out and about is awesome, especially because you're stuck inside all the time, yeah. so this is a little break, which is awesome. Stop the bike right here, nice and easy. As the saying goes, driving the train doesn't set the course. Trust the tracks during this unique experience. You know, I've always found there to be, you know, a romance to the rails. I like the idea that on the railroad, it's wherever the rails are going, that's where I'm going. I like the idea of something taking me for the ride. And we're back. Another successful journey. Thank you for watching Destination New England. Now remember to check states and destinations websites before you plan your trips and outings. We hope you have a wonderful summer when that's safe and a whole lot of fun.